And welcome, people. Uh, thanks for coming out to join us for what will be an absolutely amazing, hopefully, uh, packed uh, Play May Day. Um, we're here for RPGs. We're here for playing some fun adventures. We're having, here having some awesome um, lectures from, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be amazing. Um, I'm going to be shepherding us through the first half. We're then passing off to the safe and experienced hands of Janet and Dimmy. And uh, who will be doing an interview with uh, Lauren Slick? If you're an uh, Elder uh, Scrolls fan, that's uh, someone that you really want to get involved with. I mean, I've got some other reasons why I really like them, but their 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 experience in the role playing space is just amazing. Um, so definitely cover that. And then later on, I'll be handing over after that uh, to our community garden name. Uh, Morrow will be guiding um, ever everyone through the later session and uh, then the excellent seminar on encounter building. So I suppose, as you can see on the screen next to me, um, the Playmate day is uh, locked out. Um, I shall, we shall wait a little bit to see we, uh, how many people we've got uh, rolling in to come and see us. Um, and do, do, do. It's a bit of a different uh, time to start. So, uh, yep. Um, before we uh, disappear on, I will just go down through the list and say um, ECC Books or E. Christopher Clark, as he's known in his day job and in real life, uh, is helping us out uh, today by coming in and doing a evocative writing uh, seminar for RPGs. Um, and I say their day job is as writing professor, so you're not going to get better advice. And it's, yeah, I'm really excited to get onto that. So yeah, that's happening in just a moment, and I'm going to bring him up on stage as such in a second. Um, and then in about an hour's time after we've gone through just gold advice, um, it'll be Laura Bones GMing the first of the Adventure April Adventures. And yeah, it's uh, going to be fun, hopefully, uh, and really awesome players and stuff to interview there. And then handing off to Janet uh, for that uh, interview. I mean, the other thing is, Lawrence Schlick also is, when I say he knows RPGs and he wrote the book on it, he literally did. In 1991, there's a, a book called Heroic Worlds, which is out of print, really hard to get now. But it, docu it before Wikipedia or anything like that, it documented all RPGs written and published up to that point. Um, the undertaking was obviously massive, and the knowledge of the system and everything about the hobby just immense. And uh, that's actually. One thing I really want to talk to him about, actually. Although, but I'll be in the audience with you lot. Um, and then after that, we've got uh, Katoipoi taking another adventure. And uh, again, really looking forward to that. And then ending in uh, George Sanders, uh, another professional GM uh, for Wizards of the Coast. Um, and uh, he's going to go over encounter building and how he does it. And uh, yeah, just pure gold. So let me just bring up uh, ECC Books. <laughs> and take away that's me today's thing yeah and, uh, I, I i was looking at that book and i i had like a quasi flashback i was like i wonder if because i used to work in a um when i was uh when did you say it came out i think it's 1991 i would have okay. to check again but it's uh, i um i used to work uh at a local comic book store and and, and even when i wasn't working there I, I hung out there a lot um and uh so that, that cover i was like oh have i seen that cover like way back in the day <laughs> yeah um, it's uh I, i'm not sure if that was there i think the, i'm not sure if that's the hot because i only got the soft back because i say i'm second generation role player i'm not uh out of the fact that i wasn't there at the originals but yeah. uh yeah it's uh pretty cool yeah well, I, what, does that make me a first? I am I that old? Am I a first generation? No, I'm not. I, 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 am yeah, I like that, generation <laughs> one and a half? Um, yeah, yeah. I, was, uh, I, I got into it. I thought I thought it was all new and excellent. I was the first Pythian boy, but then I realised that uh, <laughs> I was uh, not born when they were playing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, I missed out on the uh, the amazing beginning. But uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, you're here to talk to us today about. Um, evocative writing in rpgs what that means and breaking down it's like how is it different why is it different and uh but before we get to that a quick pitch mm. introduce yourself who are you what do you yeah. do what do you enjoy about world building so my name is christopher clark i go by chris uh my pronouns are he him um and his i always forget that last one some people when they do the pronoun introduction they only do the first two and then some people do the third the all three and then i go oh which do i do 
Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I uh, am a, an author of novels and uh, short fiction primarily, although I also have uh, one book of poetry uh, cheekily titled Bad Poetry Night. Um, <laughs> I mainly write uh, suburban fantasy is what I call it, which uh, for me is uh, sort of contemporary fantasy, um, but mostly um, in the in the sort of uh, non-fantastical realm with just a little bit of, of magic thrown in there. Lots of time travel and feelings. Um, and uh, but I'm gradually heading towards and, and this maybe answers the other part of the question in terms of what I am enjoying about world building. Um, I'm heading towards a more completely fantastical uh, realm. Um, and what I really like about world building right now is doing that sort of advanced work that helps me get through the writing process later on. Um, and so uh, the novels that I'm working on right now sort of spent uh, 20 years or so building up the lore um, kind of by accident, doing a lot of uh, writing um, of drafting and, and over and over again. Uh, and for this newer idea, uh, which is more pure fantasy, um, I'm doing all the sort of world building in advance. So I have just as much material, but it's been done more strategically um, mm -hmm. so that when I get down to the actual prose writing, I just can, I can go, oh, that's where this city is. And um, and that's what this, uh, you know, tavern does. Um, this is where you can get the uh, the food that makes you grow larger or smaller in Wonderland. Um, <laughs> I am blending in some sort of um, uh, traditional uh, now in the public domain uh, stories uh, into what I'm doing um, as well. And so figuring out how to take those things and put my own spin on them has been kind of fun. Yeah, I think I've uh, encountered some of your world building around uh, some of the Peter Pan uh, yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> Peter Pan's been been fun, um, and uh, it was especially fun because I um, uh, I ended up taking the the hook, uh, Captain Hook, um, <laughs> yeah. and I um, I sort of dialed it for the most recent novel, which is pretty realistic. I but involves time travel. Um, I dialed Hook back to his like origins, like like pre-Hook, prequel Hook, um, if you will, uh, and threw him in there um, before he got all bitter and angry. And so he's kind of in there as a, you know, you could figure it out if you really wanted to. But um, yeah, yeah. but otherwise, he's just a uh, good old James of the Red Hat um uh, in the current uh draft. all right so, so people have to do a little bit of work for this this one yeah yeah you like, yeah, you like but... people to have the uh reward of oh i've read this yeah i've read this yeah, I, <laughs> I saw i saw him show up there or i was at play may day and heard chris yeah. uh, reveal it to uh to the world. <laughs> but yeah we, 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 have, we have pointed out and uh indicated where the people can find you on your website which Thank is you. uh, let's say they can get all your books and things there i say i i do quite like i say that the piano of death I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. It it, it jumped out, and uh, it certainly. Yeah, it, it was like. Well, that that's a start. I can see that. I can. It, yeah, it's a trope. I mm. can see. I can see. There's going to be some interesting stuff. Whether uh, you know. Like... Well, and that and that title is is. I mean, maybe leads us into this this talk. One of the things I wanna mm -hmm. I wanna focus on is is that juxtaposition of words that by themselves might not have as much meaning but together create this sort of like, what is the piano of death like i, I know what a piano yeah. is i know <laughs> what death is the piano of death um yeah and if i haven't tackled yeah it's like oh i don't know what that is now it that particular example sounds pretty melodramatic as, as anything of death is going to sound <laughs> but if that's what you're going for it can be perfect yeah. right so i mean i'm writing about people either in their teenage years or re-examining their teenage years mm. a lot and so using the piano of death as a metaphor um mm -hmm. uh for sort of the world coming crashing down on you works in that context you have to be aware of what you're doing uh, which we'll talk about um otherwise yeah. the piano of death is a little bit like if you're trying to write something completely serious and then you throw the piano of death in there you might have some some work to do 
Yeah, yeah. So, so is there some do-over tropes as well in there? Obviously, with uh, revisiting regrets is a common thing to in fiction. Yeah. People like uh, yeah, some very, very. Uh, yeah, I definitely, definitely don't take some time on that one. But uh, yeah, um, let's uh, take a look at other bits of world building. How did you get into world building at all? So, um, a couple of different things come to mind in terms of of my entry into world building. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and specifically the the um, the world buildery part, as opposed to the writer to the writer part, um, so the backstory part. Um, I I was a comic book uh, kid growing up, uh, and one of my favorite books to pick up um, here and there was the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, which was um, you know at the time uh, the original issues. Um, were sort of floppy comics, um, just like uh, everything else. And you'd open it up. Uh, and of course, because they were print, they were horribly outdated really fast because, <laughs> you know, they were print. It wasn't a website. You couldn't update it. Um, yeah, yeah. But you'd flip through those things and you'd have an illustration of the of the character sort of on the left. And then to the right, you'd have a sort of stat box. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was my first entry as a kid i mean i'd certainly probably heard of dungeons and dragons yeah, um, yeah. am i allowed to even say that the world's most famous role-playing game <laughs> um, <laughs> um you know so i'd heard of D, &D um but i this was really started to be oh like this is this is how powerful captain america is compared to mm -hmm. wolverine let's say um you know and so from there um one of the um one of the bonuses of growing up in the um, in the early to mid '90s is a lot of comic book stores also had a gaming component, and so I gradually sort of got um, interested uh, there. And I'd pick up books um, like uh, the Rifts uh, from Palladium Games mm -hmm. um, back in the day. Uh, uh, the Marvel superheroes role playing game was an e was obviously like an easy entry because I was already reading comics. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just really liked this idea of um, of at least coming up with some rules, some sort of baseline rules for how things worked in a in a world. I was aware that that stuff kind of was there, right? Um, you know, you go back to like even deeper into childhood and you watch The Empire Strikes Back and you go, OK, so Yoda is better at this lifting things out of the swamp thing than Luke is. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and like so you understand there are some rules there, but you you, you just sort of. Yeah, it's like, yeah they, OK, so he in, in kids terms, he's five Luke's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, five looks good. That's I like yeah. that. Yeah. So those are sort of the the early entries. Um, and then eventually, you know, I got interested I had um, I had a friend who tried to get me interested somewhere in middle school and tried to get a bunch of us together to play um, to play D and D, but I wasn't as into fantasy at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was when I picked up the the Marvel superheroes RPG that I was like, oh, I I I like this, I understand it, and then that backwards got me reinterested in in D and D. And what I realized was, no offense to the friend who tried to get us into it. A lot of it comes down to the GM, um, you know, uh, when it comes to yeah, the gaming yeah. in particular. And so once I found um, a GM who I really clicked with, uh, then it was like, oh, I could kind of play anything. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, in fact, so. did we at a, at a certain point, the, the gaming group that met at my comic book store was running. I don't know how we fit this all in. Did we have any lives? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we, <laughs> we had uh, two uh, Heroes Unlimited campaigns, which was Palladium Superheroes RPG, that were interconnected, yeah. and I think we also had two uh, AD and D Second Edition campaigns going. One of which was kind of uh, sort of bog standard fantasy, uh, and the other one was a Ravenloft game. As I as I recall, so we had like four games going on at any particular time, and I don't know how <laughs> we well, no, uh, we did yeah. it. Yeah, you know, university is a time to discover that you can play forty eight hour long, uh, long games. <laughs> And that you desperately try and fit your studies around role play, but then it, you may yeah, end up. You, you, you may also end up either becoming 
part of the establishment and staying at university like you did to mm -hmm. I'm working there so you can carry on with that or right. you end up working in the industry somehow so we're both uh, recovering yeah <laughs> and and one of the benefits about at least some of us ending up in yep. academia is that you get at least some professors who are understanding of of the students <laughs> who are coming through doing the exact same thing which I certainly right. had uh, okay. there's an we're gonna take we're gonna take a hard left now because I yeah. think we're overrunning because I know yeah. that I want to talk to you about this, but uh, yeah. we have a topic. We do have a topic. So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hard left us into right. the beginning of um, evocative, uh, RP, uh, say RPG writing by yeah. just sharing one of my favourite um, mm. bits of uh, writing. In the fact that um, it, you may remember this, it's just I think it, it displays it pretty well. It's the intro to the Traveller book. They've eschewed any artwork. Uh, this was uh, the kind of one of the one of the first um, science fiction role playing games, and uh, the point being is uh, that oh, let me just picture on the screen is um, it's yeah. There's no artwork. It's literally the hook line is you look at the front of the book and you see this. Yeah, this is the free trade of Beowulf calling anyway. Anyone, Mayday, Mayday, we're under attack. Main drive is gone. Turret number one not responding. Mayday. Losing cabin press fast, calling anyone, please help. This is free trade of Be Beowulf, Mayday. And that hooked me. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Well, and, and not example. just you, you got Bob and Atari <laughs> 2600 yeah, yeah, yeah. killers. Um, yeah. It's, there's something um, very like, well, and of course, there's something even more evocative about this, um, about this cover. Uh, however many years on which is the fate the faded nature of like the fact that it's been worn mm -hmm. like the the um uh the um not fabric but the the paper has yeah. acquired this particular thing but even back in the day i can imagine part of what it's doing and this is something we can not that we're going to talk about punctuation a lot in this <laughs> talk but the use of ellipses um there the three dots um mm -hmm three periods in succession is super interesting in terms of grabbing the reader and making them understand. I, I've been told by yeah. students uh, that, that I, as a, as a generation X or overuse the ellipses, that that's a generational thing, <laughs> uh, but I will, you know what, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, yeah. And that, this is part of why is I look at this and I go, that is part, I don't know if it's, I would guess it's part of what ended up hooking you because you can yeah. understand it's like that, that three dots is like the, the static. That's the. That's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's either it gives the allegation either Morse code or radio static or yeah. D going dot 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 <laughs> like, yeah, I forgot I, how much i missed dimmy doing i hope he has not <laughs> forgotten that and that we get it again um he has uh, not. this summer camp but uh yeah it's uh yeah i just just thought i'd open with that because i say it i think it shows how fundamental that it is to role-playing games that you have that hook it's not always the art you can just do it with that but i say i'm going to step back slightly and i'm going right. to give you the floor and you're going to take us through evocative writing for rpgs excellent Thank you. I say, take. All right, here we go. Um, so yeah, a little bit of left turn. Um, hopefully, this all uh, remains entertaining for you with just my head on screen, not not the two of us having a chat. Um, so uh, we're gonna go here. Um, and a little bit too much randomness. Well, you know, I was in a. Uh, speaking of randomness, my college radio show was called Complete and utter randomness, but I will try very hard to keep on topic here. Uh, so I've got three sort of major um, uh, topics. I like to um, sort of let you know where we're going um, as, uh, as I get started so that you have a sort of feel for things. Um, the first of these uh, is what are we trying to do, right? I want to start and inter, uh, you know, and I, uh, introduce us to like, what are we trying to do when we sit down to write? Um, the second uh, thing, and that's just what we sit when we're writing in general. The second thing is I want to talk, talk about rules of the genre, things to keep in mind. And a lot of you probably already know this, but we're going to sort of reinforce these things. Uh, rules to keep in mind for this genre in particular, for role-playing uh, games and, and what you need to keep in mind. Um, and then... Uh, of course, get to uh, specifically a section called evocative writing and my tips uh, for that. So what are we trying to do when we sit down to write? Um, 
there's two things, right? We're, we're trying to uh, do something for our eventual audience. So players, GMs, right? And we're trying to do something for ourselves when we sit down to write. Um, so when we sit down to write, what are we trying to do for our players or the GMs using our stuff? So I'm going to quote uh, here from a book called uh, Ron Carlson Writes a Story, which, if you not, have not guessed already, is by a fellow named Ron Carlson. Uh, so in his book, Ron Carlson Writes a Story, Mr. Carlson puts it this way. He says, quote, I use Boyle's Law from chemistry many times when talking about scene. We need a container into which to put our material so we can heat it up and find out what it is made of. One more time, I use Boyle's Law from Chemistry many times when talking about scene. We need a container into which to put our material so we can heat it up and find out what it is made of. So that's our job as people writing for role-playing games. We need to provide the container. The, 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 you know, in some cases, we're also going to provide uh, you know, ready-made characters and, and things like that, but we're providing in general, a container into which the GM and the players can put their characters and see what they're made of, right? Um, that's that's the goal. Uh, for them, for us, we have, um, we have another goal when we sit down to write. Um, here's Carlson again, um, but I'm substituting the word campaign everywhere that he uses the word story in his original quote. Um, so, uh, just, just make it make a little bit more sense for this particular, um, uh, talk. So Carlson says, quote, our rule shall be include things, not because we're trying to clutter our campaigns up so that the sheer catalogs of clothing, furniture, drinks, sporting equipment, make their own kind of effluvial music, or because we want to select the most symbolic or meaningful element in a character's life, but because we are looking for a way to survive the writing or the running of the campaign. So I'll pause there for a second in the middle of this quote. Um, that's what we're trying to do for ourselves when we sit down to write, is we want to survive the writing process. So how do we do that? That's what this quote is about. Um, when in doubt, include things, writes Carlson. We may have... We may have our character uh, over the sink trying to get the lid off the espresso maker while not getting water on the sleeves of her silk blouse, and we may not know her state of mind, but at least we have that small appliance, the running water, and her sleeves to help us into the next sentence. So we want things to get us through the writing of, uh, of a campaign, of an adventure. Um, you'll see... Uh, pointed over the wrong shoulder. You'll see behind me, uh, in addition to all the books, I have a number of uh, different sort of card type games. Uh, this is one of the ways that I keep going. I have a thing called the Storymatic, um, which is cards that help prompt story. It's primarily useful for, um, for contemporary fiction writing, but I think they probably have some other um, some other stuff out there. So Storymatic, something you might look at. Um, I also have a thing called Shadow World, which is a visual prompt um, card game uh, in which the 20 or so cards that are in the deck can all be connected in any way you want. So the edges are formatted so that you could basically spell out visually an entire adventure, which you could then uh, write, um, you know, from just that inspiration. And they've got a number of different um, uh, different uh, card decks. Let me, um, that is uh, Magical Muriel Ramas uh, is, the, uh, is the name of the company that puts those out. You can find them uh, typically in like uh, your bookstores um, and things of that nature, but also on, uh, on all the online stores. Um, so again, what we're trying to do when we sit down to write, we are um, trying to uh, give our players, our GMs, um, a container into which to put their characters to see what they're made out of. Um, and for ourselves, when we sit down to write, we want to be prepared with plenty of stuff so that we don't stall out, right? Um, okay, so... I want to talk a little bit more uh, here before we move on to uh, rules of the genre uh, about writing habits. Now, I'm only going to talk a little bit about this because tomorrow um, I am going to be on stream again because you can't get enough of me. Um, 
uh, with Moro um, to talk about writing habits and developing writing habits. So I won't I won't spoil what we're going to talk about there. But um, how do we get into a good writing habit here um, as uh, people writing for role playing games? Um, daily exercises. Uh, can really help keep your muscle right, muscle writing muscles nimble. Now, if you don't have time for daily writing exercises, that is okay. I am not the person who's going to sit here and shame you for whatever frequency you can do your writing at. That's not me. And I wouldn't listen to those folks if they're like, you need to write every day. What if you can't write every day? That we were we all live in different situations. Um, so whatever your frequency is, Starting with a daily, starting with a daily, a weekly, a monthly, whatever you're doing, writing exercise can keep your muscles nimble. Um, something that just gets the wheels going. So uh, it might be looking at one of the prompts on uh, on World Anvil. They're all over the place. Um, I think we have several members of the community who have put out uh, their own prompts. Some uh, for free, some uh, for a small fee. Um, grab those. Uh, just just give yourself ten minutes right, uh, is one of the things that I do at the beginning of all of my writing classes. I give the students 10 minutes to write. Um, a lot of them get nervous. They're like, do we need to turn this in? I'm like, no, this is for you. Just, just get to it. Um, point number two, give yourself permission to suck every once in a while. That is key. Um, there's a great graph uh, that um, I saw in a TED Talk, uh, not a TED Talk, <laughs> um, uh, an XOXO Festival talk uh, years and years ago. And the graph is a pie graph. Uh, it's got a big chunk of 70%, a small chunk of 20%, and a small chunk of 10%. Can you guess what the 70% is? 70% bad. Uh, this is by a guy who was writing a song every day. Every day he wrote a song and he just, wait, how did he do it? How did he keep himself going? By admitting that 70% of what he wrote was going to stink. 20% um, of it would be okay. And 10% of it would be good. I really love that there's that 10% that's good because it acknowledges that sometimes we actually get it pretty right on a first draft. Uh, and that's not something you hear a lot. Um, acknowledging your strengths is also um, a key. You have strengths. You do not suck, right? You might write something that sucks every once in a while, but that does not mean that you suck. All right, I'll get off my soapbox and my pep talk um, there for a second, but I just, uh, I always like to throw that in there when I'm talking about writing. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Uh, as our class says in the chat, done is better than perfect. Make something that sucks rather than nothing at all. Hey, yeah, I think. Because you can make something that sucks better, not all the time, uh, some water went flying there. Um, not all the time, but you can make something that sucks be at least a little better. You can't make something that doesn't exist be better. Um, okay, so let's talk rules of the genre. Um, here are some specific things to keep in mind uh, when you are um, uh, when you're writing for role playing games. Uh, you have a lot of text, right? comparable to some other genres, right? You got a lot more text than a poet does. <laughs> you probably have more text than a short fiction writer or a fiction writer does, right? Um, so you have to pick where you spend the most time. Um, you've got a lot of text. Where do you spend the most time? Um, I'm gonna pause here to give a shout out to everybody who's been stopping by my Twitch streams over the last week um, uh, to, to give me some help on prepping for this talk. I'm going to name some of them. Um, others I will forget to name, uh, but I want to, I want to just give them a shout out. Some of them are here in the chat and I do really appreciate it. Okay. So where do you spend the most time when you've got all the text in the world to develop? So our friend RPG dinosaur Bob shared on stream the other day, Quote, when I write adventures, the intro and the script pieces are where I try to ensure things are interesting and evocative, right? So the introduction, which everybody's going to read, uh, and then the script pieces, the pieces that are going to get read aloud by the GM to the players, those are the parts where Bob is spending the most time. Now, you, you, know, you may want to shift that balance a little bit. Maybe you want to be spending more time on the instructional bits that are just for the GM. That's for you to decide. But generally speaking, this is one person's way of, um, of getting this done, right? 
uh, Bob continuously says for the GM instructional bits in between, I focus more on guidance and uh, helping a GM customize or deal with renegade parties, right? Um, so those are two different kinds of writing too. That's the other thing to keep in mind for this genre is that you're, you, you are sort of in one mode when you're writing for the performance, right? So either the part that gets everyone hooked and makes them wanna play, um, or the part that gets read out loud while they're playing. That's one type of writing. The other type of writing, the sort, sort of more instructional type, is still fun, can still be interesting, but it's different. And so don't beat yourself up if you can't shift really elegantly from one to the other. It may be that you sort of batch a whole bunch of the one type of writing, uh, the more evocative stuff that we're talking about today, and then you batch um, the other part, the sort of more instructional um, stuff elsewhere. Okay, so you've got a lot of text. You have to pick and choose where you focus your attention. You need to worry about um, options for various party sizes. That's a thing specific to this genre, right? So when you're writing for RPGs, you need to consider how the story might change uh, if there's just a couple of players or if there's a dozen, right? Um, you probably, you know, you probably are are able to put a sort of uh, two to four players or two to, you know, give yourself a range so people know what they're getting in for. But you do have to consider that range. Um, other things uh, that you need to consider, alternate ways to get to a key place, a clue, et cetera, right? These are really important um, when you're writing for role-playing games. Um, so that's extra writing, right? That's extra stuff you have to consider. Um, so uh, my main advice um, just in general on the writing of RPGs is that it, it is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Um, this is why I have a hard time writing them myself. I'm very often a sprinter and I want to get things done. I want to do, do, do. Um, I have to remind myself it's a marathon. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, you need to consider and create different ways to move the players forward in the story because players are human beings, right? This is something else that we as people writing for RPGs have to consider. If you're a fiction writer and you thought that dealing with characters taking over was hard, just wait until you see what real life human players do with your story. Okay. Um, session reports are a thing, right? This is a whole separate other thing, but this is an opportunity, right? If you started off like I did as a fiction writer, um, session reports are an opportunity to slip back into your comfort zone, right? Um, this is an opportunity once you've shared them with your players also to determine which parts of the adventure were most effective and memorable. You share the session report, you get the feedback back from the players. It's a sneaky little way of doing a survey. Uh, in the MFA program that I help to run, we send out a survey to the students at the end of uh, every residency. We get a decent response, but it's a survey. It's a form you have to fill out. You, as an RPG writer, as a, as a game master, write a session report, look at the comments. It's a sneaky little way of finding out, oh, they really like this part. Mm, they didn't, they either didn't respond to this part, you know, um, and so then I have to decide, did they just, you know, were the other parts just so good or did I maybe fall flat there, right? Um, and that is an opportunity for you to determine whether or not your evocative writing had any, um, Thing to do with either result um love this point from uh from kit um learn to use yes and instead uh, and no but right uh those and and buts are super uh are super helpful that's kind of an improv thing right uh the yes and in particular is is a lesson from improv and i'm a big believer um in taking lessons from different storytelling um, disciplines and bringing them across. So yes, and is absolutely something to bring over from improv and uh, realize that um, uh, that that's a good way to keep story going. That's how improv people do it. Yes, and. <laughs> uh, just looking at the chat again, going back a second and saying, uh, Bob has an excellent point there uh, that characters may be lawful good, but players are universally chaotic neutral. Um, very excellent point there. Okay, so if you're coming over from another form of writing, um, I wanna share a couple of uh, bits of advice from chatters in my Twitch stream over this past week. So say you're a fiction writer like me coming over to, uh, to role-playing uh, writing. It's all about plot. We think about, in fiction writing, we think about character, setting, um, 
this, that, and the other thing, um, my Twitch uh, uh, channel chatters were very much like it's all about plot. I would add it's, you know, you also want a, a convincing setting, right? Um, but the rest of the story is carried out by the players. Um, another chatter added that playwriting is a super useful thing to think about when writing um, for an RPG, right? You think of an encounter as a scene, right? Several scenes make up an act, which is an adventure. Several acts make up a play, and that's a campaign. Um, so just some uh, excellent advice shared by the chatters uh, over in my stream this past week. Okay. Um, you also got two audiences. This is this is one more thing um, that uh, that um, I'm going to pause there because an excellent point here from Arc Law. Uh, the characters are the plot too. So bring the hammer down if the players make the. Is that should it be? Do or don't bring the hammer down if the players make the plot incons inconsistent. But it's yeah, the characters are related to plot. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I struggle. My university makes me uh, generate a rubric to say. Uh, I just look. I was walking like an Egyptian there. Um, uh, or. No, Vogue, Vogue, I suppose. Um, my university makes me uh, grade my students based on a rubric. Um, and so there are four columns in the rubric. One of them is character, another one is plot. Well, those things are super related and, and people outside uh, writing may not understand that. So yeah, it's plot and character are super uh, related. <laughs> Do bring it down, says our plot. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, audience. That's another thing that we're thinking about here um, as role-playing writers. Uh, we've got two things to think about, right? Um, we've got the GM, if the GM isn't us, right? Um, and then we've got the players and we need to serve both audiences. So again, that's something for you to consider as you're sitting here um, and thinking about how to approach the writing is which part of the audience am I focused on today? So, um, do you help write for the GM to enjoy or for the GM to craft a handout or for the GM just to perform or both? Um, going back to uh, RPG Dinosaur Bob, uh, thanks Bob for all the useful uh, quotes. And again, to all of my chatters this past week, um, Bob uh, told us in chat, uh, writing adventures for publication is writing two things at once. You have to hook the GM on the overall package, but then you have to write the narrative pieces to hook the players. Uh, he added later, um, the introduction needs to be able to hook everyone, right? Um, even players will read an intro and then ask their favorite DM to run the adventure, right? Um, so yeah, you've got you've got to consider that you've got different uh, different audiences there. Okay, let's talk about some rules specific to shorter things, um, and this is the last section. Uh, of this before we get in specifically to talking about evocative writing. Um, so rules for writing shorter things, one shots in this case. Um, I hope you'll permit me uh, a couple of quotes about short stories, which I personally think are pretty close to one shots and which are my favorite kind of storytelling. Um, and so we're just gonna sort of imagine uh, when I say the word short story, if I haven't already substituted the word um, one shot or campaign, we're just gonna, um, we're going to uh, sub things in here. Okay. So here's one from Neil Gaiman. A short story, one shot, uh, is the ultimate close-up magic trick. A couple of thousand words to take you around the universe or break your heart. So again, a short story, one shot, uh, is the ultimate close-up magic trick. A couple of thousand words to take you around the universe or break your heart. Now, remove the couple of thousand words um, there and just imagine it's it's a couple of hours, right? Um, the people who are going to do, uh, streams for us later today, uh, who are going to put these, uh, these campaigns on, they've done that, right? They're going to, you know, take us around the universe, break our heart, um, make us laugh for a couple of hours. Right. Um, and, uh, and I'll get to this, but if you like what you see today, not that I'm like telling you to do homework, but I'm telling you to do homework Write down afterwards, or maybe while it's going, some of the lines, um, that Laura and Kit um, and their players uh, write down some of that stuff that comes out um, as we are uh, watching these things throughout the rest of the day. Because one of the ways you get better at writing is by taking notes on the things that you read, or in this case, the things that you watch or listen to. 
Okay, back to these couple of quotes. Um, I love short stories uh, because I believe they are the way we live. They are what our friends tell us in their pain and joy, their passion and rage, their yearning and their cry against injustice. That's from my favorite writer, Andre Debuse. So again, let's substitute in the word uh, one shot or campaign. Um, I love one shots uh, because I believe they are the way we live. They are what our friends tell us in their pain and their joy, their passion and rage, their yearning and their cry against injustice. Very often, if we're sort of hearing a story about, um, or hearing a story afterwards about a particular group, um, about a, a we're hearing short stories, right? People can't remember the whole details of, of long campaigns, but they can remember what happened on one night or what happened in one one shot. Um, uh, yeah, um, I do like that quote. Uh, <laughs> I apologize to Kit, who in the chat is saying uh, he wasn't feeling pressure before, but I just made his palms sweat. Um, I did see, uh, thank you, Secondhand is, is answering um, the question from Fate of the Dice. Uh, um, any tips for a new DD stream? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that would, I think Secondhand's advice there is, is, uh, uh, is good. Um, uh, and for this last quote from Kurt Vonnegut, I'll swap out the word story for one shot and the word reader for player, because I feel, uh, I think it still makes sense. Um, and I'll paraphrase just a bit. Okay. And this is a bit cheeky. It's a bit cheeky, but go with it. <laughs> Laura and Kit, I did not mean to make you nervous. There's a reason that you're the ones like out of all the people who have, who have written one shot, you're the ones that are going to perform for us and you're going to do excellent work. And we're going to learn from it. We're going to have fun and we're going to learn from it. So I did not mean to make you feel nervous at all. Um, I apologize if I did. Uh, okay. So Vonnegut quote, a one shot. He did not say one shot. Remember, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Um, <laughs> he's a kind of, I don't know why everyone is nervous, but now I am too. I was super nervous before this started. I'm super nervous now. Um, hopefully it's going well. Uh, this is just par for the course when you're sort of sharing stuff that you love with other people who love the same stuff. Nervousness is okay. You'll get through it. Um, all right. Finally, the Vonnegut quote. And remember, he didn't actually say one shot. I'm just uh, paraphrasing. A one shot has to be a good date because the player can walk away at any time. Remember, players are selfish and have no compulsion to be decent about anything. A one shot has to be a good date because the player can walk away at any time. Remember, players are selfish and have no compulsion to be decent about anything. Yes, cheeky, absolutely. Maybe a little true. I'll leave that up to you. All right, evocative writing. Um, I got a bunch here and not as much. <laughs> I've, I've talked a little bit long on the other things, but I promise we're going to get plenty of meat here um, in this last section. Okay. And I thought I didn't have enough material. Uh, <laughs> uh, so going back to Ron Carlson, um, what is evocative writing? Uh, it is evidence that will convince us that the story could actually happen. It's evidence that will convince us that the story could actually happen. Put another way, um, I'm going to quote here from Janet Burroway and writing fiction. And this, this one, a, a second hand, I said, see, um, said, write these quotes down. This, this one, I really think you should pay attention. And, and, and specifically these two words that I'm going to throw out to you, significant, concrete details. This is what evocative <laughs> will bring you back. We'll talk transformers. Absolutely. Um, significant, concrete details. Um, that's what you want for evocative writing. So what is Burroway talking about there? A detail is significant if it conveys an idea or a judgment or both, right? As a detail is significant if it contains, can conveys an idea or a judgment or both. A detail is concrete if it appeals to one of the senses, sight, touch, taste, smell, hearing, right? So we want significant concrete details. Not even as many, I was gonna say as many of those as we can get in. Sometimes it just takes one, 
right? Just sometimes it takes just one evocative detail and we we're golden, right? Um, sometimes it takes one every few minutes. Um, it's going to depend on what you're doing. Um, you don't have to push it. Not everything needs to be evocative or else the reader, the, the, the player will get overwhelmed. Okay. My other advice, don't skimp on the senses that are hard. Practice, right? So if you're sitting here going, I don't know how I would describe taste. Um, I don't know, aside from bitter or sweet. Well, first of all, bitter or sweet is a great place to start. Okay. Um, I don't know how I would describe smell. Um, practice. So Patrick Suskind, um, he makes us smell old Paris in his book, Perfume. Right. Um, great book. Um, even if all you do is go to like Amazon and do the look inside and read the first few pages, um, you'll get great stuff about smell. Um, James Baldwin in the in the story Sonny's Blues can make us hear music even on the page. Just the way that he describes um, the performance at the end of that story, we really hear that music. So just practice. And when you hear somebody do something awesome that makes you hear something, that makes you um, be able to taste something, write that down. How did they do it? Um, uh, this is all leading towards um, a point that I'm going to uh, to bring up. Um, Stuart Dybeck can make us taste what the kisses of our parents' youth tasted like in his story, We Didn't. Um, they tasted like, uh, just as a spoiler, they tasted like um, too many uh, too many Diet Cokes, no, sorry, too many Cokes and several different flavors of lip gloss. Um, okay, I wanna give two examples, right? Two examples of, um, uh, of evocative writing, uh, one is highbrow and one is lowbrow. Um, so in writing fiction, Janet Barraway gives us an example of non-evocative writing. I want to read that one first, and then I'll give you the good uh, the good version, and then we'll get to the lowbrow uh, thing in a second. So this is my highbrow example. So here's an example of storytelling that fails to appeal to the senses. Debbie was a very stubborn and completely independent person and was always doing things her way despite her parents' efforts to get her to conform. Her father was an executive in a dress manufacturing company and was able to afford his family all the luxuries and comforts of life, but Debbie was completely indifferent to her family's affluence. Um, now, I'll pause here to say that non-evocative writing could potentially be something, you know, that you're writing in those instructions, those things that aren't meant to be read aloud because non-evocative writing has its place. It communicates details sometimes pretty effectively and pretty efficiently. Okay. But this next uh, version I'm going to read to you is almost as short, but way more evocative. Here we go. Debbie would wear a tank top to a tea party if she pleased with fluorescent earrings and ankle strap sandals. Oh, sweetheart, Mrs. Chittister would stand in the doorway, wringing her hands. It's not nice. Not who? Debbie would say and add a fringed belt. Mr. Chittister was artistic director of the Boston branch of Cardine and had a high respect for what he called elegant textures, which ranged from hand-woven tweed to gold filigree, in which he willingly offered his daughter. Debbie preferred her laminated wrist bangles. Okay, so just by adding a couple of specific details in there, um, we go from eh to wow, right? Um, we've got fluorescent earrings. We've got ankle strap sandals. So sometimes it's just one adjective, one noun, you know, one sort of modifier um, and one subject. Uh, then we've got... Um, I also want you to pay attention to verbs. Wringing her hands, right? There's a, there's a certain... We get that. We understand wringing her hands, right? Okay, fringed belt, um, handwoven tweed, gold filigree, uh, laminated wrist bangles. Um, so, yes. Okay. The lowbrow example. People who follow me on Twitter might have seen the other day as I was preparing for this talk, I was listening um, to the uh, the works of comedian Patton Oswalt. And 
might have thought, what on earth is he doing? Uh, what does that have to do with evocative writing? Well, I would venture to say um, that, and I know I need to go go quicker here because we uh, want to have time for questions. Um, I would say that a comedian is a master at evocative writing, a good comedian, right? Because they need to um, they need to hook you real quick, uh, and they need to keep hooking you again and again and again, right? Um, and and if we think of our famous pungent here on the World Anvil channel, <laughs> that's evocative writing. Some of those things they evoke um, they evoke that response really, really well. Um, okay, so here's a lowbrow example of evocative writing. Um, I have cleaned up the language just a touch for the sake of a general audience. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sailor Nightwing, yes, puns evoke groans. Um, all right, so here's my lowbrow example from Patton Oswalt's uh, Finest Hour. Quote, what if I 1,000% believe, and I 1,000% I, I believe it, that there is a giant invisible butt hovering over me? And if I wasn't nice and helpful and courteous and charitable to everyone I met, the butt would appear, suck me up into it, and I would be devoured by poop piranhas. And I mean, I believe this 1000%. I would be the nicest guy you ever met. It'd be like, Patton, you're so helpful and charitable and courteous. Why is that? And I would go, it's funny you should ask me that. You can't see it, but there's an invisible butt hovering over me. And if I'm not nice to everybody, it'll appear and suck me up and I'll be, well, I don't need to tell you about the poop piranhas. We all know about them, right? That's why I listened to Pat Mazel the other day, <laughs> because his comedy evokes uh, laughter from me. Right. Uh, and I can imagine the giant invisible butt um, hovering over me and the poop piranhas. Uh, and I will leave it up to you, uh, the adults in the room, to um, to determine which words I swapped out. Um, <laughs> Or you can go listen to it yourself. But I will throw in the caveat. Um, one of the things that I uh, recognized about that um, about that album the other day uh, is there is a problematic uh, bit that I think even Patton would say today is a problematic bit. I think the album is um, 11 or 12 years old. There's a problematic bit um, called The Circus. Uh, and I don't think he would do that bit today. Uh, but um, I'll just... Uh, I'll just throw that in. It's not, it's not terrible, but it, you, yeah. Okay. So if you're listening to the whole album, just watch out for, watch out for the circus. Uh, uh, okay. And that one was called Finest Hour in case um, you, uh, uh, you're interested. Okay. So big old tip. Juxtaposition of words you wouldn't necessarily expect together can lead to memorable language. At the very least, it'll lead to novelty, and human beings like novelty uh, just as much they fear poop piranhas, right? Poop piranhas. Now, that's not the same phrase that Patton used. Actually, it has a silliness to it that would be completely appropriate given a particular audience. I can say, as Sailor Nine says, yeah, it's of its time. Uh, how to get better. All right, here's some cheats on how to get better at evocative um word uh evocative writing a word diary i know this sounds again I'm, I'm giving you homework but but hopefully you came here prepared for a little bit of homework um whether it's a, a word document uh, a note um somewhere an actual physical thingy um keep a word diary Write lists of great verbs, adjectives, and adverbs that feel right for your type of storytelling. Um, something that you can go to in a pinch. Remember the, the I keep pointing over the wrong shoulder. Remember the bit about being prepared, about giving your stuff, uh, self stuff. So the other day I was at a, a Barnes and Noble um, for a variety of reasons, and I went to their gaming section. Um, I opened up uh, one of the first gaming books I saw and just started writing down words, uh, shroud, eerie, waged cornered the word raise as in raising an army or raising a castle these are um fantastic words that if i were sitting there completely struggling i would go oh go to my word diary and say okay what are some what are some words that i could use okay some other tips i mentioned writing exercises earlier 
Um, here's a great writing exercise. Um, one way to test your skill in the use of concrete, significant detail is to create a reality that is convincing and yet literally impossible. Now, I know most of us are writing, if we're writing for role playing, we're writing fantasy, we're writing science fiction. We are writing things that are, are literally impossible. So go with me here in this exercise for a second. Uh, what, what I want you to do, if you get a chance, um, begin by drafting a few paragraphs in which a single impossible event happens in the everyday world. Now, I know that's not the world most of you are writing in most of the time, but I, I think you'll get something out of this. So for example, a dog tells fortunes, a secret message appears on a pizza, the radio announcer speaks in an ex-husband's voice. Um, think of supermarket tabloids. They can be a great source of ideas. Um, what you do in this exercise is focus on using detail to create the reality of both the normal world and the impossible event. And the more believable the reality is, the more seamlessly the readers will accept the magic. So that's one exercise. Um, and maybe the the least um, uh, the 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 least fun, but possibly the most useful thing for getting better at evocative writing. Um, oh, sorry, Do sorry, Bob, that the audio garbled for a few minutes. Um, hopefully, it's fine now. Um, okay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, annotations. Um, this is the thing we uh, we preach in the graduate program where I work. Um, they sound terrible, uh, but if you approach them the right way, they can be super, super useful. Um, and what I mean by annotations is this is what I was talking about earlier, not to make Kit and Laura nervous again, but when they do something awesome and they are going to do awesome things, I'm telling you right now, Laura and Kit, you are going to do awesome things. I believe in you. When you're watching them and they say something awesome, write it down. And then later you go back to it and you look at it, right? So the next time you pick up a campaign module that you really love or read a one shot on World Anvil that knocks it out of the park, I want you to do this. I want you to, uh, and this is to paraphrase Janet Barraway again, read the way a young architect looks at a building or a medical student watches an operation both devotedly hoping to learn from a master and critically alert for any possible mistake, right? You want to look at the stuff that you want to write and analyze it and go, how did they do that? Not why did they do that or what did they make me feel? How did they do that? And that's why I say, Kit says something awesome. Laura says something awesome. I'm sorry I keep using you as examples. I hope I'm not making you turn too nervous. You're the people who are going up today and I believe in you and I love you. Um, we're going to write something down and we're going to go back to it later. We're going to go, okay, let's look at that sentence. Let's look at that particular thing that they did, maybe even by accident. Um, and how did they do it? What words did they use that help us um, make the thing? Um, so key ways to do this, um, uh, aside from just writing down what you hear today, uh, retyping a key passage. So you see something, have it in one window, open up a text document, start retyping it. That is a way that you'll get a feel for how sentences are built. Um, okay, page count or word count the sections, right? So if you're like, I don't know if my call out blocks or my, um, my, my introductions are too long or too short, actually grab a professional one, one that you love, see how long it is, um, and, and then compare. Now, you don't have to be exactly like that person that, that is published that you love, but if you want to get close to them, that's a way to possibly do it. Um, create a tropes bingo board. I love doing this with my students. They have a lot of fun with it. Um, write down, create a bingo board, um, B-I-N-G-O at the top, um, uh, uh, an equal number of boxes down the bottom, a free space in the middle. You can look up what bingo boards look like. And in each box, fill out, a small little thing that a writer that you love or a gamer that you love, a, a, a GM that you love, write something that they do a lot of um, or something that you do a lot of can be interesting as, a, uh, as an exercise yourself. Then try to win bingo by using those tropes in your own work. Um, so you really love somebody who writes a particular um, thing, try to win bingo. Last thing. Um, and I know I've gone right up to it. Um, I know uh, also that that secondhand uh, said we have a little bit of, of leeway. Um, Mad Libs. 
Um, try taking a sentence from an adventure that you love and remove the nouns or remove the adjectives or remove the verbs. Um, this is what Mad Libs were as, and are as a game. Then replace them with your own, right? So on a very basic level, you see a phrase that you love, right? Just replace the words and see what happens. Have fun, play. That's how we get to evocative writing. Second hand, <laughs> do we have any time for any questions? I'm sorry. That we do. Yes, yes. Okay. We do have time for questions. As I say, it's, uh, it, it's a little bit of wiggle room. So we're, we're going to take 15 minutes and cool. uh, beg Laura's apology. But uh, yeah, we've uh, got, a, got a few things that came out through the week. I mean, one of the questions that um, I tripped over on my uh, trips around the forum, um, as I say, was uh, oh, there was my word when I say when I... I'm tripping over my mind. Uh, yeah, it was evocative writing in in conjunction with uh, constructed languages or conlang. Mm -hmm. I say, be it, uh, throw in a frack from Battlestar Galactica, slang yeah. references from an in-universe event like "see bloody tree" from Memory, <laughs> Sorrow, and Thorn. If you read uh, Tad Williams, um, mm -hmm. how should we be using our conlangs evocatively when writing our RPG material? Or is I it love this voice? question. I I love I love 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 this question. Um, so and my and my feelings on this are evolving. Um, my traditional feeling has been when you're going to throw in a conlang or even just an inventive invented name, like if you haven't even gotten into conlanging, but you've got a name um, is to look at um, and this is going to sound super nerdy and super like I do not want to hear about syllables. I'm not in in school anymore, but um, looking at the syllable structure of something um, in the uh, in the language, the primary language that you're writing in and trying to match it as post as close as possible. This is my my general belief. So the reason that frack works so well in Battlestar Galactica is because it's the <laughs> same. It's the same mm -hmm. syllable as one syllable. Um, and then beyond the syllables, look at where the consonants are. Um, so or, or pay attention to things if you happen to notice them. So that particular word starts with an F and ends with a K. It's got a pretty similar sound to what it's trying to emulate. <laughs> um, where I've seen students stumble when they're writing in secondary world um, fiction, which is what a lot of us are doing, you know, <laughs> secondary world fantasy, is that they come up with these long words which are impossible to say. Uh, which are impossible to say. And I have some students who totally lean into that. And one of them, once one of my most brilliant students, was like, I don't care. I like let you struggle with it. Cool. If that's what you want to do, like absolutely have fun with it. But my general advice is to look at the language that the primary language that you're writing in and then try to fit your um, uh, fit your conlanged word um, in there if you can. Um, the way that my thoughts evolved on that is that's a very, you know, that general thought is very English specific, right? There are words in other languages that don't sound the same as English words. And so they are going to fit in differently. Um, and so I just, I think it comes down to how do you fit, how do you make the words fit in to the rhythm of the sentences that you're writing? Um, cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump in for an audience question from today, which was, um, yeah, uh, he said, because this is the one I always struggle with, Janet's really good at this name, but we'll pretend Janet said the name. And it's <laughs> This can end up with a very vulgar descriptor, but I've often found myself overusing the word rot when describing the odor of a carcass or an ender creature or something like that. Not only, as uh, I say, this is just directed to everyone in the chat, but it was uh, this thing. It's like, what are other good terms to describe smell of death or anything mm. where you, you've, you've got into a rut? How do you change lanes? Yeah. Um, well, so I I work primarily on a Mac, but you can also do this same thing with. Uh, and so it has a built in dictionary, which I just opened up. Mm -hmm. We can do this online. Um, there might even be um, a built in dictionary somewhere on on Windows. You can pick up. Um, a, but basically, you're looking for a thesaurus. Um, mm -hmm. And a thesaurus is not always going to give you the right thing right away. Um, but um, it can lead you down the path. Um, you want to give yourself uh, a time limit when you when you dump when you dive into this too, because if you're if you like words, which a lot of us as writers do, you could get lost in the thesaurus and forget what the hell you were writing. But so I've looked up rot. Um, uh, we've got uh, decay, decomposition, corrosion, mold, moldiness, mildew, 
blight, canker, putrefaction, um, putrescence. Uh, so then, then that gets me thinking about putrid, um, which is a fun one. So just as a as like a as a basic like alternate to rot, putrid uh, can be. Um, uh, With a slightly yeah. more fantastical or I yeah. suppose, archaic focus, I've picked up these two uh, yeah. storytellers for Russian story. Oh, those look really. great! Yeah, they're, and, they're, they're just um, because they're focused around fantasy and sci-fi. Exactly. Uh, just, yeah, they go the more specific. Yeah, the more specific you can get. Um, I started writing in a new, um, in a new genre recently. I won't get very specific because it's not. Uh, <laughs> we've got a more general audience, but I went and I looked for um a sort of uh looked online for lists of words so even if you don't have it in your budget to go out and get um one of those beautiful books uh, that andy just showed us um like you could look online for like fantasy uh fantasy terms or or things like that um mm -hmm. and get uh get get a, get a list going and that's why i say kind of keep a um kind of keep a word diary uh, i i now have the start of one by going to the store the other day and sort of looking through that i was like shroud and eerie and like the those <laughs> sorts of things which seem pretty straightforward but then when i'm writing i completely forget about them i when i'm writing and i need the word eerie i may completely forget that the word eerie exists and that's why it's good to have a good have a list okay we're, we're gonna try and fit in two more we've got it we've, right. we've got about nine minutes but we can get okay. through this and the ending i'm sure we, we can do it i believe in us all right i believe us <laughs> Re, right regarding in word placement and selection any advice for non-native english speakers oh i saw this one earlier what's the first part mm -hmm. of the um first part so, of the yeah, question? In, uh, regarding word placement and selection is um there any advice for non-native english speakers because um you know the, the the weird rule in english uh that we don't all know but it's like the brown fox jumped over the mm. or no whatever. there's a there's a certain you uh in I english, know you, yeah yeah i can't remember the name of this structure but it's got color size da, da, da. there's like seven of them and we do yeah. it intrinsically we know when it's wrong right uh, and i and, don't know what it is though <laughs> yeah no but that's a great point and 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 so what that what i would suggest in that case because i can't remember what it's called either and i and you're right i do it intrinsically most of the time um but the the key there for a non-native English speaker is to sort of bookmark those resources if you can find them. So I'm trying in my brain um, to think, uh, let's, I think it's adjective order uh, English. Um, yeah, I think that's the one. It's just like, yeah, I'm just really order. bad at it because I never, I, you just know it, don't you? Here it is. Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, boop -a -doo. Uh, let's see forgotten a few categories where is this one um, quality size shape color provenance <laughs> oh, yeah. so that's a bit that's a bit academic for me i'm sure there's a simpler version yeah the, um let's see this one that somebody in this chat in this uh thing came up with was opinion size age color material purpose yeah so i mean for things like that, that are like these weird quirks of, of English, um, I think it, it's best to sort of bookmark those. Um, we in the, um, and, and if, if possible, grab yourself a sort of um, uh, a style manual to sort of have around. Um, the, it may not be possible, it may not be in your budget, um, which is why I say sort of search the web and see if you find things. But there's one that we at the university give to or at least we used to, um, uh, to every incoming student, including students who are um, uh, speaking English as a, as a second language or learning the second language. Uh, and it's called A Writer's Reference by Diana Hacker. Um, it's, uh, you want, generally speaking, I say, if you're gonna buy it in hard copy, you want the plastic comb version, which is like 13 bucks, it looks like. And the reason that's great is it flips open and it sits there on your desk. You don't have to like put something on one page to like hold it open like a paperweight. Um, and uh, it is a great uh, reference. Um, a little academic, you know, a little dry, but but generally one that uh, that we uh, have some students will keep around for their whole uh, career. Okay, then. And yeah, the last question we've got in is, is, are callbacks and referencing more important in a world that isn't real? 
So a shout out to a major in-universal event and riffling on that. Is that something that uh, can be done, should be done? What's the opinion? I I think yes, absolutely. So um, I had a student uh, years ago um, who one of his favorite things to do would be to just drop in these um, mentions of events, mentions of worlds or whatever. And this is why he never struggled for ideas his entire time he was in college, because he could just go back to a previous story and be like, oh, that one line about the battle of such and such. Um, uh, I'm going to write about that this time. Um, or, uh, you know, he might call back to a story that he'd already uh, written. So whether it's sort of calling forward um, or calling back, I think it could be super useful. Um, you think about the original um, uh, Star Wars, right? Uh, who are the Jedi? Um, you know, uh, they're, you know, uh, what are the Clone Wars? Well, that sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like now we know what the Clone Wars are. But, you know, 1977, you're watching this, you're like, ooh, the Clone Wars, like, I don't know what that is, but that sounds interesting. It's got a, you know, it, it's again, looking at the language and going, all right, the blank wars. So the single syllable wars is generally going to be enough for somebody to go, oh, OK, I, I know what that is. Uh, or mm -hmm. they may not. They have no idea what it is, but they're like, no, I, no, it's the Clone Wars. I, I get it. <laughs> um, or um, I'm, no, I'm going to Tashi Station to pick up some power converters, right? Like, what the hell is a power converter? I don't know. Yeah. But Tashi Station yeah. is yeah. enough of a place name that we go, okay, I believe that's a place. And a yeah. power converter <laughs> sounds like a thing you might need in in wherever this is. Yeah. Um, and you know the character's been there before. So when yeah. it comes up or something like that, you know that, oh, yeah, people are going to recognize him there. So there's yeah. all kinds of, as you say, call outs without having to do the legwork of describing yeah. it. I mean, like, who <laughs> the hell knew what the outer rim was until they said the outer rim? Like, that sounds like a thing. I get it. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that has brought us back in. Um, Laura and uh, the tribe of goblins are now chomping at we the We need bits, cookies so for them. We must, yeah, we must all prepare. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we're finished. Uh, we're uh, finish almost. Up again. Like, it's not in arm's reach. There are some cookies right over there. I. It'd be a great uh, prop right now. But. Well, posting them. No, no. They will definitely have to post those. Um, uh, they, they will be just. They will be distributed. We will have it sorted. But um, yeah, we'll finish up on the um, going back into the. Oh, now I've uh, skipped the screen. That'll teach me uh, to try and do that. Well, ah, I'm stuck on the adjectives I looked up. That'll teach ah, me not to Google on my main <laughs> screen. <laughs> it's like, um, but um, yep. And yeah, in closing, it's uh, back to that old uh, traveler thing again because with callbacks. Um, we did have the uh, thing 20 years later, GURPS uh, Traveler was released. Mm. And into this nice bit of evocative writing, um, they uh, had the GURPS uh, section entitled Free Trader Beowulf. Come in, Free Trader Beowulf. Can you hear us? Come in, Free Trader Beowulf. Hang in there. Helps on the way. Mm. It's like, I would buy that book. <laughs> it's like, that was yeah. a great pickup of the original cover. And yeah, uh, yeah just uh, dragged me in again and uh, made another sale. So, uh, yes. Call back I will now I will now say goodbye to ECC books and Thank I hope you, everybody. everyone can clap and send demands for cookies. Those are the two things you should be posting. It's uh, <laughs> and we will drag in uh the rest of uh the crew. And uh I've to say thanks so much for coming on. And um, I'm going, it's only the beginning of the day, but I can feel it's gonna be a good day. Yeah. So uh, yeah, hang around and uh yeah, there's some awesome stuff coming up. So, yeah, thanks very much, Chris. Go Bye about everyone. your day. Have lots of fun. And I hope stay you stay here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stay. I'm leaving, but you're not. Dial. 